Foreign players in NPB have always been seen as something of a necessary evil. A supplementary piece that gives your team that small advantage it needs to just get over that mountain. Despite the often attributed stereotype of expensive and expendable, there have occasionally been standouts that become legends in the Japanese game. In the 50s, it was Japanese Americans like Wally Onamine and Andy Miyamoto. In the 60s, pitchers like Joe Stanka and Gene Bach carved themselves out of some of the most dominant pitchers of all time. And in the 90s, Ralph Bryant and Bobby Rose became legitimate faces of their franchises. The 2000s saw the three-headed monster of Tuffy Rhodes, Alex Cabrera, and Alex Ramirez tear the league apart. And even in the last decade, Matt Merton, Vlad Valentin, and Dennis Safarte have all etched their place in the record books. But one decade stands above the rest in producing some of the most beloved, revered, and well-regarded foreigners of all time. The 1980s. To start our story of the 80s, we actually have to start in the late 70s. In 1977, the Lotte Orions signed Liron Lee. Liron was different from other foreign players. He was a seasoned Major League veteran who is still in his 20s. Now, why is that so weird, you may ask? Well, because previously, it had been one way or the other. Either a player had bounds of MLB experience, like, say, Willie Davis, or they were a minor leaguer in their 20s, like Chico Barbon. Liron was one of the first foreign players to enter MPB in their prime, at 29 years old. In his first year in MPB, he led the Orions in hits, doubles, home runs, RBI, slugging, OPS, and war, something his predecessors, John Briggs and Jim Lefevre, had utterly failed to do. Liron would lead Pacific League in home runs and RBI, be named to the Pacific League All-Star team, and would be the only foreign player in either league to be named to the best nine that year. The next season, he convinced the Orions to take a chance on his younger brother, Leon, and the brothers quickly became the one-two punch of the Orions' offense, soon joined by a resurgent Incheon Park and Hiromitsu Oshii. 1980 would be Leron's best season, as he went 358, 398, 595 with a 993 OPS, putting up 4.9 war and winning the batting title, leading Pacific League in hits, and making the all-star team in best nine again. Great season, right? Well, Leon was even better. 340, 408, 638, 1,039 OPS, 5.2 war, and also made the best nine. Couple that with a breakout season from Hiromitsu Ochiya and Shoji Murata finally getting some help on the mound, and the Orions, despite playing in the absolute dump known as Kawasaki Stadium, finally became a respectable team again. The deadly quartet of the Lee brothers, Ochiya and Michio Arito would anchor the Orions' offense for the next three years, until, in a shock move, the Orions traded Leon across Kanagawa to the Taiyo Whales. But why? Well, they wanted to bring in a fringe big league closer named Steve Shirley. Shirley would be their top closer for 1983, but a failed experiment at starter the next year led him to returning stateside. Meanwhile, Leron was still chugging along, picking up two more Best Nine awards as the Orions DH, joining the 1000 Hit Club in his sixth season in 1983. Ochii was now the undisputed leader of the offense, but Lee was a scary number two right behind him. Then, in 1987, Ochii was traded to the Dragons, and Liron, now 39, retired. Bill Madlock would fill his role for one season before Mike Diaz took over in 89, but his best season falls outside of my window. All in all, Liron and Leon Lee revolutionized what it meant to be a foreign player in Japan. The brothers would live in Japan full-time, becoming fluent in the language and endearing themselves to the people of Kanagawa Prefecture like no foreigners have done before. It wasn't until 2005 that the Orions, now across the bay as the Chiba Lotte Marines, would have foreign players who would have anywhere near their impact. Despite an egregious Hall of Fame snub, Liron sits second all-time in career batting average, only recently passed by Nori Aoki. Staying in Pacific League, the Kintetsu Buffaloes started the 80s with 1979 PL MVP Charlie Manuel at the helm of their offense, 
and despite only playing for them for two years, those two years were, suffice to say, utterly dominant. In both seasons, he would put up an OPS of over a thousand and lead the Buffaloes in pretty much every offensive category you could name. But by 1981, he was back with the Tokyo Swallows and Kentetsu had to replace him. So who did they replace him with? Sabermetrically, one of the worst players in MLB history. Despite carrying an MLB war of negative 6.3, statistically third worst in the integration era, Vic Harris would be brought in for the Buffaloes alongside Ike Hampton. While Hampton was average at best, Harris slotted right in as their starting second baseman and proceeded to put up the best season of his career, leading the Buffaloes in home runs, RBI, slugging, and OPS. Granted, the Buffaloes were utterly terrible, but that doesn't discount how good of a season it was for Harris. Vic would keep up pace in 1982, but his injuries would soon derail his season. Still, with Shigeru Karihashi and Koichi Hata returning to form, it was enough for the Buffaloes to reach third place. But in 83, it would all fall apart, and Harris would be cut midway through the season, replaced by a minor leaguer named Terry Lee, who despite putting up impressive numbers in his 44-game stint, would also be gone at the end of the year. At this point, you're wondering, Gaijin, I thought you said this video was about good players. Aside from that one MVP, so far you've only mentioned one above average guy and a couple of flops. Well, patience is a virtue. And in 1984, the Buffaloes would finally get their guy, Dick Davis. Davis would be the face of the mid-80s Buffaloes, putting up numbers Buffaloes fans hadn't seen since Manuel, leading the team in nearly every offensive category by a large margin. Davis was the kick in the pants the Buffaloes needed to drag themselves back into contention, as he would put up an OPS of over 900 in his first four seasons with the team. And when three-time MLB All-Star and 1980 AL home run leader Ben Oglevy joined them in 1987, the offense got even better. When their pitching finally caught up in 1988, it looked like there was nothing the Buffaloes couldn't do. But there was one thing Dick Davis couldn't do. Stay off the damn weed! Davis's arrest and subsequent deportation left the Buffaloes with a hole in their offense that needed to be filled, and they began looking for any stopgap option they could find. And it just so happened that the Chiniki Dragons had this guy named Ralph Bryant in their minor league system. A phone call later, and Bryant became a Buffalo, and proceeded to demolish Pacific League. 307, 381, 719, 1100 OPS, 34 dingers, 73 RBI, in only 74 games. What Bryant did in the back half of the 1988 season was extraordinary, and the Buffalo saw themselves deep in the dogfight for the Pacific League pennant. A dogfight that they would lose by the second smallest margin in NPB history. 0.002 winning percentage. Only the 1974 Yamiuri Giants were less fortunate as they fell to the Dragons by 0.001 winning percentage. Bryant and the Buffaloes weren't done, however. Bryant kept up his 1988 pace over a full season this time, winning PL MVP and setting club records for homers and RBI in the process, records that would stand until 2001. Coupled with Herman Rivera and Takahisha Suzuki, the Buffaloes would make the 1989 Japan Series, where they got reverse swept by the Yamiuri Giants and the 1989 Central League MVP, Warren Cromarty. The Giants had started the 80s with former Yankee Roy White as their primary gaijin, and it worked out rather well for them. White was among the best players in all three years he was with the team, putting up at least 100 hits in each of his three seasons and getting a ring in 1981 for his contributions. However, at 38, he was not going to be around long, so he was replaced by Reggie Smith for 1983. Smith also had a very good season, becoming the 1B to Tatsunori Hara's 1A. A small problem, he was also 38. And while he did stick around for 1985, he would be joined by a 30-year-old former Expo fan favorite named Warren Cromarty. Crow slotted right into an already stacked offense, and would lead the team in home runs and RBI in his first full season, quickly making himself a favorite of manager Sadaharu O. Cromarty, Hara, and Sadaaki Yoshimura would become the offensive core of the Giants throughout the rest of the 80s, and perhaps their best season together was 1986, where Cromarty put up an OPS of nearly 1100 and led the team in hits, doubles, homers, and RBI. Deep in a pennant race with a carp, Cromarty would be hit in the head by an Eret Hikaru Takano fastball, putting him in the hospital. But, not wanting to let his team down, Crow would sneak out of the hospital and show up at Jingu Stadium the next day 
Coming off the bench, he would hit a grand slam. Cromartie's 1986 would prove to be his best by both traditional and advanced numbers. 37 home runs, a slugging percentage over 600, 193 OPS plus, and 199 WRC plus, to go along with 8 wins above replacement. He only struck out 58 times too. But, like the Buffaloes of 1988, the Giants fell to the carp in a ludicrously close pennant race, 0.003 winning percentage. The Giants would win the pennant again in 1987 thanks to Kromarty, Hara, and Yoshimura, but would lose to the Lions in the Japan series. In 1988, the Giants came second to a Dragons team that came absolutely out of nowhere, and Kromarty spent the season injured. Sadaharu O would step down at the end of the season, a move which really upset Kromarty, as he wasn't nearly as close to his replacement, Motoshi Fujita. But, the Giants management wanted one of their best players to stick around for the opening of their new stadium, Tokyo Dome, so Cromartie would stick around. Cromartie would go on to have a fantastic season. Despite his power numbers drooping, he put up an absolutely ridiculous batting average of 378, tied with Seiichi Uchikawa for fourth all time. Batting averages in everything you say? How about a 449 on base percentage? Despite hitting only 14 home runs, he still put up a 560 slugging percentage for an OPS of 1009. As stated earlier, the Giants would finally climb the mountain and win the Japan Series in a reverse sweep at the Kintetsu Buffaloes. The only Japan Series in a seven year stretch that was not won by the Seibu Lions. Hell, the Seibu Lions didn't even compete in it. Kromarty would play one more season in Japan before returning to finish his career with the Kansas City Royals. And in a move that I'd consider a middle finger to those who slag off MPB, Cromarty put up remarkably similar numbers to his final MPB campaign. Speaking of those Lions, how about them? The Lions of the 70s were, well, bad. And under new ownership that had, you know, money, they looked to build a contender for the future. Leading the Lions into the 80s were Koichi Tabuchi, Takuji Ota, Masahiro Doi, a 45-year-old Katsuya Nomura, and two foreigners, Jim Tyrone and Taylor Duncan. While Tyrone flourished, putting up 35 home runs, Duncan, hampered by an extremely weak ankle thanks to injuries suffered in his minor league career, would be cut midway through the season, thanks to his atrocious defense. Replacing him was former Giant and Cub third baseman Steve Ontiveros, or just Steve. Steve quickly became a core member of the Lions, leading them in OPS for the second half of the 1980 season. In 1981, Tyrone ended up on the Hawks, and former Yankee and Giant Terry Whitfield was brought in to replace him. Whitfield would also have a great season, finishing 4th in Team OPS and being named to the best 9, while Steve was marred by a sophomore slump. Numbers like the ones Steve put up in 1981 would often see a foreign player get unceremoniously cut, a la Duncan, but the Lions did something weird. They believed in him. Steve and Whitfield would be back for 1982, but they'd also bring in someone else to manage. Tatsuro Hirooka To say Hirooka was an authoritarian manager was an understatement. He strove to control nearly every aspect of his players' lives. Steve, perhaps realizing that he wouldn't get any more slack from the organization, turned around and led the team in hits, doubles, and walks, going 307, 399, 440 to lead the team in OPS, winning his first Best 9 award, while Whitfield led the team in home runs and RBI. They'd win the first half and make the Pacific League playoffs, something that manager Hiroka felt they didn't deserve after their weak second half, but they still beat the fighters in four games to make the 1982 Japan Series, their first appearance since 1963. Carried by the strong pitching of Osama Higashio and the Matsunamas, as well as Steve and Terry's offense, they'd win their first Japan Series since 1958 over the Chinichi Dragons. 1983 would be more the same, Steve and Terry putting up great numbers while chafing under Hirooka's managerial style. They both put up OPSs of over 900 that year, second and third to Koichi Tabuchi. Whitfield would have a career year, putting up 38 home runs and 109 RBI for his second Best 9 award, while Steve went 321, 419, 506 for his second straight Best 9 award. That year, the Pacific League introduced a new playoff format. If the second place team finished five games back or less, there'd be a playoff series. Seibu won Pacific League by 17 games and that rule was quickly scrapped. In 1984, Whitfield, tired of Hirooka, made the jump back to MLB to join the Dodgers. Seibu replaced him with longtime expo Jerry White. White would be average, but Antiveros would have his best season, 
going 338, 443, 542, and leading the team in hits, doubles, RBI, walks, and OPS. Despite this, the Lions would only finish third in Pacific League that year, behind Lotte and Hankyu. 1985 would be Antiveros' last of the team, as homegrown stars Koji Akiyama, Hiromichi Ishige, and Aiji Kanamori quickly became the new triple threat on offense. Steve still put up a good season, and so would their other new foreign player, Taiwanese pitcher Tai Yuan Kuo. As a 23-year-old rookie, he went 9-5 with a 2.52 ERA and a 1.164 whip in 15 starts. Sure, his FIP was 4.77, but it doesn't change the fact that he threw the 7th no-hitter in Lions history against the Fighters on June 4th, 1985, the first in 18 years, becoming only the third foreign pitcher to throw a no-hitter in Japanese baseball history. This stacked roster would lead them all the way to the 1985 Japan Series, where they'd meet another team led by a foreign legend, but I'll get to him later. Antiveros wouldn't be re-signed at the end of the 85 season, and was replaced by an 18-year-old kid named Kazuhiro Kiyohara. Instead, the Lions added former Cleveland name redacted and Philly outfielder George Vukovic, who would slot right into the outfield platoon the Lions ran. While he wasn't overwhelming with the bat in his hands, he'd quickly become known for his clutch hitting, driving in the winning round of the 1986 Japan Series against the Cart, who were the only team of the 80s to make the Japan Series without a single foreign player on their roster. Vukovic would help the Lions win another ring in 1987, but he'd leave after that, and they would pick up a 24-year-old Angels prospect named Ty Van Berkelio. And Van Berkelio would go absolutely off. 38 of his 98 hits were home runs, and he drew over 80 walks, finishing the season with an OPS over 1,000, something no line had done since Koichi Tabuchi in 1983, and he was an integral part of the 88 squad that so famously edged out the Buffaloes for the pennant. Van Berkelio was looking to be the next breakout MPB star, but he just kept getting hurt and never put up numbers anywhere near that again. On the upside, he's had a very successful coaching career and has been Cleveland's hitting coach for the last eight years. No matter, because there'd be a new face about to hit over a thousand, Orestes Distrade. Distrade came over in 1989 to replace a hurt Van Berkelio, and he and Kiyohara put the lines in their backs, ultimately falling just short of the Buffaloes for the Pacific League pennant. Destrade would go on to be the foreign face of the Lions through the early 90s, who would retire a Lion in 1995 after a brief two-year stint with the Florida Marlins. But once again, that's out of my purview. Remember how I said the Carp didn't have a foreigner on their team in 1986 and still, albeit barely, won the pennant? Well, how'd that happen? The Carp started the 80s with probably their best foreign player ever, Jim Little. Jim had joined the Carp in 1977 alongside Adrian Garrett, and they would join Hall of Famer Koji Yamamoto to form the best outfield the Carp have probably ever had. While Little's hitting left a little to be desired, oh, brother, this guy stinks. his defense was legendary, and he and Yamamoto picked up four straight gold gloves in the outfield from 1978 to 1981. In fact, Koji Yamamoto won the Central League Gold Glove Award for the first 10 years it was awarded. Little would be an integral part of he and the Carp's second title in 1980, picking up Japan Series MVP honors in the process. His best season would probably be 1981, where he went 318, 362, 578 for a 940 OPS, receiving the only All-Star selection and Best 9 award of his seven-year NPB career. Art Gardner would join the team in 1981, but after a weak 1982, he was let go, and Little left for the Nankai Hawks, leaving the Carp with just one foreigner on their roster. Tim Ireland, who was mediocre at best. He did pick up a ring in 1984 when the Carp beat the Braves for the 1984 Japan Series alongside reliever Dave Rajcik, but both were gone at the end of the year. And the Carp, seeing how well they'd done with mediocre foreigners, decided that they could do it without them. And to be fair, they almost did. They came second to the Tigers in 1985, and then barely edged out the Giants in 1986 for the Central League pennant. But they'd be reverse swept in eight games by the Cebu Lions, and longtime stalwart Koji Yamamoto finally retired. Realizing the error of their way slightly too late, the Carp would bring in Rick Lancelotti and Randy Johnson. No, not that one. That one. 
Lance would be their primary slugger while Johnson would be a solid contact bat off the bench. After two years of third place ball, both would be gone, replaced by Wade Rowden and Rod Allen, who both put up 850 OPS seasons as the Carp had their best season since 1986. Small problem, the Giants had one of the best seasons ever. Rowden would be replaced by Mike Young, while Allen would finish the decade, with his great play largely overshadowed by chasing a scared shitless Kazuhiko Daimon into the outfield of Yokohama Stadium after Daimon decided it would be a good idea to throw at his head. I'm sure a lot of you watching have been wanting me to cover one guy, but there's another guy who played first base for a team based in Hyogo that I think you should know about. And here to teach you about him is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Take it away, dude. The Hankyu Braves entered the 1980s on a quest to cement themselves as a dynasty. In the late 60s and early 70s, the Braves fell short in the Japan Series five times, losing to the juggernaut Yomiuri Giants each time. But as the Giants' reign of terror came to an end, the Braves established their own mini-dynasty winning three straight Japan Series titles from 1975 to 1977, including two triumphs against the Giants. They fell one game short of four-peating in 1978, and lost in the Pacific League playoffs to the Buffaloes in 1979, but the Braves were determined to continue their league dominance into the 80s. The two foreigners on the team at the time were Venezuelan second baseman Bobby Mercano and American outfielder Bernie Williams, not to be confused with the Yankees legend. Starting in the mid-70s, the two were a big part of the Hankyu offense, and their arrival coincided with the Braves' three championships. Marcano was a free-swinging slugger. He hit 298, 324, 522, with 23 home runs in his first year in Japan, and his best season came in 1978, when he hit 322, 346, 574 with 27 home runs, leading the league in RBIs and total bases, and recording 6.8 wins above replacement. He also won four Gold Glove awards. Williams, on the other hand, struggled a bit, particularly in his debut season in Japan, but won a pair of Gold Gloves himself, and he hit 258, 316, 437 with 96 home runs and a WRC Plus of 102 during his six-year stint with the Braves. Unfortunately, after some harsh regression in the pitching department, the Braves finished the 1980 season in the B class for the first time in 10 years. Not the best way to start a new decade. The following year, the team brought in first baseman Wayne Cage, who went on to hit 31 home runs for each of his two seasons in MPB. And Marcano left the Braves to join the Swallows after the 1982 season, making room for two new foreigners to join the club, second baseman Bump Wills and first baseman Greg Boomer Wells, not to be confused with the pitcher David Boomer Wells. Wills was a respectable player, hitting right around league average and playing good defense for his two seasons with the Braves, but Boomer Wells was the real success story of the generation for the Braves. After a brief unsuccessful stint with the Twins and Blue Jays in MLB, Wells attended the Hawaii Winter Meetings after the 1982 season. The Hunching Tigers were initially interested in signing him, but they settled on a future superstar of their own, Randy Bass. So Wells joined the Hunky Braves, and there was no shortage of hype surrounding him. At 6'5", he towered over most of the Japanese players, and it's been said that during his first spring camp in 1983, an elderly man suffered a heart attack in shock after seeing Wells hit two out-of-the-stadium home runs on television, earning him the nickname Boomer for his booming home runs. So he's kind of the OG version of Nelson Cruz's boomstick nickname. Boomer had a good rookie season, hitting 304, 348, 471 with 17 home runs, but nobody was ready for his 1984 campaign, as he posted a 355 batting average and a 1012 OPS with 37 home runs, 130 RBIs, a 173 weighted runs created plus, and 6.0 war, winning the MVP and becoming the first foreign player ever to win the Triple Crown. With Boomer's help, the Braves made the Japan Series for the first time in six years, but lost in seven games. He hit 34 home runs the following year, then exploded for 42 and 40 dingers after that. His 1986 season was actually even better than his MVP campaign, as he batted 350, 418, 654 for a 1072 OPS, 180 WRC+, and 6.8 WAR. 
He played with the Braves slash Blue Wave franchise until 1991 and retired the year after that, finishing his MPB career with 277 home runs and a 927 OPS in 1148 games. And despite his profile as a slugger, Boomer actually did not strike out very much. He even walked more than he punched out and had a minuscule career strikeout rate of 6.8%. Unfortunately for the Braves, the team continued to put up good but not great seasons for most of the 80s, and the Cebu Lions eventually swooped in and took over their window of opportunity. American Brad Leslie posted a 3-flat ERA in 69 innings out of the pen for the Braves in 86 and 87, but no other foreigners made a significant impact. In the end, it was all about Boomer Wells. Thanks man, you can check out his channel here, he posts a lot of great MPB content. If you love what I do, you should definitely check out him as well. Now. Before I get into the guy I'm sure you're all waiting for, how about a quick lightning round of some good guys on other teams? Bob Horner famously joined the Tokyo Swallows for 3 million bones in 1987 and put up an OPS of over 1100, but fled back stateside due to the stress brought on by the ridiculous pressure and media harassment he received, despite the pleas from Swallows fans and management for him to stay. That, plus an event that happened the next year, became wake-up calls for teams and media when it came to how they treated their foreign stars. Larry Parrish had two fantastic years with the Swallows and Tigers to end his career. Future Brewers and A's manager Ken Maka was an integral piece of the early 80s Dragons, helping them make the 1982 Japan series. And remember Dave Rajsik? Well, his brother Gary became the 1B to Hiromitsu Ochiai's 1A on the late 80s Dragons, which made the 88 Japan series, which they also lost to the Lions. The Wales started the 80s with Pete Lecoq, who I'm only mentioning because his name was literally Pete Lecoq, before getting fantastic years from Jim Tracy and the aforementioned Leon Lee. Small problem, they still sucked, even after Carlos Ponce, Jim Aducci, and Jim Pachuric had fantastic seasons to close out the decade. That's why you don't neglect pitching, kids. Also, Ponce's fan chant was literally La Cucaracha. I just thought you should know that. Chris Nyman and Dave Hostetler became above average players for the Nankai Hawks before Tony Bernazard became the face of the turn of the 90s teams. Ah, look at the top of his head! <laughs> and finally, Tommy Cruz and Tony Cialota anchored the early 80s fighters teams before Tony Brewer took over in the late 80s. So, I've kept you waiting, haven't I? A certain Hanshin Tigers legend who tore the league apart. A certain curse-causing giant Oki that is the default answer when people talk about the best foreign players in history. But first, who came before him? The late 70s teams had Mike Reinbach, who probably deserves a place among the pantheon of the best foreign Tigers of all time, putting up 13.8 war and an 858 OPS in his five years with the team. But he'd be gone at the end of the 1980 season, replaced by Doug Alt, who slotted in amongst the Tigers' best hitters, putting up 18 homers and an 850 OPS. But he'd try, unsuccessfully, to return to the Jays at the end of the year, upset with the early season firing of manager Don Blazer, who'd done a lot to get him there in the first place. They'd replace him with Kim Allen and Greg Johnston, who were mediocre at best, before sauntering down to Hawaii to take a look at a couple players, former Jay Greg Wells and fringe journeyman Randy Bass. As you just saw, the Braves took Wells, leaving Bass to the Tigers. Bass joined an already strong offense and made it even stronger. Four Tigers had an OPS of over 900 that year. Bass, Akinobu Mayumi, Akinobu Okada, and the face of the franchise Masayuki Kakifu. Nearly half of his hits were for extra bases, and he was tied with Kakifu for the team lead with 50. If their pitching could get its act together, the Tigers look like they could be really, really good. Randy would be the only foreigner on the Tigers going into 1984. His batting average and on-base percentage would improve, but his slugging would dip slightly, and a mid-season injury put him out of action for two weeks, and the Tigers would fall out of contention. Bass would still finish the season with a 998 OPS and a 158 OPS plus and WRC plus. Not bad by any means. In fact, was pretty good. <laughs> in 1985, the Tigers finally realized that their problem was pitching, and with a foreign roster spot open, they went and signed former Royals pitcher Rich Gale. 
Gale joined Ace Yoshihiro Nakata as the one-two punch of the rotation, attempting to mirror the one-two punch of the 1960s, Minoru Murayama and Gene Bach. Never mind that neither of them were anywhere as good as Murayama and Bach, as they both put up ERAs over 4 and whips over 1.4, but the Tigers came to find out that didn't matter so much, because their offensive core went absolutely nuts. Akinobu Mayumi put up 160 hits, 68 for extra bases, and finished with 34 home runs and a 991 OPS. Kakefu cranked 40 homers of his own, driving in 108, finishing with a 1017 OPS. Akinobu Ukada hit 35 of his own, and also finished with a 1057 OPS. Then, there's Bass. 350, 428, 718. 1146 OPS. He leads Central League in hits with 174, home runs with 54, and RBI with 134 for the fourth Triple Crown season in Central League history, and the second foreign player to win a Triple Crown in as many years. Even the advanced batting stats boggle the mind. 7.3 war, 187 OPS+, plus, 186 WRC+, plus, and an isolated power of 368. What's scarier? He wasn't the only player to win the Triple Crown that year. Hiromitsu Ochiya did it in Pacific League. Bass would win MVP, as well as make his first All-Star team and his first Best 9. How he didn't make it the two previous years is beyond me, but nevertheless, the Hanshin Tigers had won their first Central League pennant in 21 years. And some enterprising young men thought it would be a good idea to check a statue of Colonel Sanders into the Dothanbori Canal. I would go further, but this video is already way too long so look for that one in two weeks. The 1985 Japan series was the stuff of legends. Two high-powered offenses got even more powerful as they decided to buck tradition. For the first time ever, a designated hitter would be used in the Japan series. And to further that, it was a universal DH. A DH wouldn't be used in the Japan series again until MTB finally mandated its use in 1990. In Game 1, Bass went 1 for 3 with a 3 run homer in the ninth. The only runs either team would score all game. Gale would start Game 2 and go 7 innings giving up only 1 run, a 3rd inning bomb from Hiramichi Ishige, but that ultimately wouldn't matter because literally the next inning, Bass put up a 2 run homer, and the Tigers would win 2-1. Seibu would win Game 3, despite Bass hitting another 3-run homer in the 3rd, and Game 4 would also go Seibu's way, as Bass was held to only a walk. The Tigers won Game 5, with Bass going 2-3 for three with a walk, scoring twice, and just like that, the Tigers looked ready to win their first ever Japan Series. Gale started Game 6, and despite giving off a leadoff homer to Ishige, he pitched a complete game, while the offense demolished Seibu's pitching staff. Bass would go 1 for 3 with 2 walks and an RBI single, and it would all end when Tsutomu Ito hit a comebacker that Gale threw right to Bass. Boom. Hanshin wins their first, and so far only, Japan Series. Bass, after literally winning games 1 and 2 pretty much single-handedly, was a no-brainer for Japan Series MVP. It seemed like there'd be no way to top this season. Wait, he did? In 1986, Bass went 389, 481, 777 for a 1258 OPS, 176 hits, 47 of them home runs, 389 ISO, 379 BABIP, 239 OPS plus, 237 WRC+, plus, 9.7 war. I'd say those were video game numbers, but considering that baseball video games looked like this at the time... Ball. I think that even transcends that. He set the all-time record for a single season batting average. Not even Ichiro could beat it. His 1258 OPS was second all-time to Saraharu O's 1974 season. It was such a good season that he nearly won MVP despite the Tigers finishing third. But Sawamura award winner Manabu Kitabapu just edged him out. The Central League MVP award had only been awarded to players not on a pennant winning team twice. 
and both times it was Sadaharu Oh. In 1964, when he set the home run record, and in 1974, when he set the OPS record. In all fairness to Oh, the 74 Giants lost by literally the slimmest margin of all time, but 64 was kind of BS. It wouldn't be until Ballantine broke the home run record in 2013 that a player would do it again, as despite his offensive outburst, the Swallows would finish in last place. Back to Bass though, a second triple crown, all-star selection, and best nine win in as many years. In Pacific League, Hiromitsu Ochiai did it again as well. Then in the offseason, it happened. Ochiai joined the Dragons. Now you had two multi-triple crown winners in the same league at the same time. Who would win? Neither. Bass's numbers would fall for the 87 season, but he still put up an OPS of over 1,000 and hit 37 homers. But it wasn't enough to lift the Tigers out of last place, even with new signing Matt Koff putting up fairly good numbers on the mound. Fun fact, Matt's dad Marty played a year with the Nankai Hawks in 1968 family connections. 22 games into the 1988 season, Bass already had 25 hits and was leading the team in OPS, but the team was struggling. Longtime manager Yoshio Yoshida had been fired after an awful campaign the last year, and Bass was not happy with it. Especially with the more old school direction new manager Minoru Moriyama was taking the team in. Bass felt that the fall off in 1987 had been the fault of a complacent management. And at a team meeting, he reportedly said to Moriyama, I'll be here at the end of the year. I doubt you'll be. Then, Bass got hit with a blind side. His son was diagnosed with a brain tumor. As part of his contract, Bass and his family's medical bills would be paid by the team, and the surgery to remove the tumor would cost $40,000. The Tigers didn't want to pay that. So, after Bass left for the States to be with his son through the procedure, the Tigers fired him. They claimed that he didn't have permission to leave, and this was insubordination. Small problem, Bass did have permission. He'd recorded the meeting with team management where he had asked for permission. And the consequences for this were deep. Fans rioted. Fellow Tigers legend Masayuki Kakafu openly voiced his disgust with the move, and Bass immediately launched a wrongful termination suit. Tigers managing director Shingo Furia overwhelmed by the internal team pressure as well as the external fan pressure, jumped off a balcony and killed himself a month later. Bass was only 34. He hadn't shown signs of decline. The Tokyo Swallows, fresh off losing Bob Horner, offered him a contract that was reportedly twice what he'd been making with the Tigers. Friend and rival Hiromitsu Ochiai lobbied hard for Bass to sign with the first place Dragons, and the newly moved Fukuoka Hawks also offered him a deal but Bass would turn all of them down. What's worse, the Tigers tried to rehire Bass, not as a player, but as a scout. Bass would be disgusted by the offer, and considering that he'd thought to record the meeting, he probably felt like something like this was gonna happen sooner or later. He wouldn't return to baseball for seven years when he played in the Suntory Dream Match, an exhibition game for retired legends in 1995. In 1998, he'd become the chief American scout for a Japanese team. But it wasn't the Tigers. It was for the Yamiri Giants. After losing a Titan like that, what are the chances another 1,000 OPS bat would just fall into their lap? Well, that's exactly what happened. Pissed off with having to sit behind Fred McGriff on the Blue Jays, Cecil Fielder took a one-year prove-it deal with the Tigers and went 302, 403, 628 with 38 homers and a 1031 OPS. Meanwhile, Matt Koff had morphed into the Tigers' ace, putting up a 276 ERA and 379 FIP in 1988, and a 372 ERA and 380 FIP in 1989. The Tigers were still terrible, but it was something. And that puts a wrap on the decade. Never before or since has this amount of foreign talent been assembled in NPB at one time. The reasons why this happened come from all sides. It could be the Japanese economy falling apart in the 90s, MLB's increased acceptance of sabermetrics causing players of this caliber to not be exposed as often, or a million other reasons. But at least we can look back and appreciate what these players did for their teams, and how they linger on in the hearts and minds of those who watched them play.
But with the Hawks signing Carter Stewart and MLB and MLBPA at each other's throats again, a new golden age may be right around the corner. Hey all, sorry this one's a week late. Uh, you can check the video length if you want an explanation. Uh, I'd like to thank the Yaki Cosmopolitan for helping me out on this, and as well as uh, doing that part on the Honkyu Braves. You should definitely check out his channel if you enjoy what I do, uh, especially because he posts a lot more regularly than I do. And check for more collabs in the future. Also, if this video has piqued your interest and you want a more lighthearted take on uh, foreign players and Japanese baseball in this era, uh, you should definitely watch Mr. Baseball if you haven't already. It's definitely up there with the best baseball movies of all time. And it's even fairly accurate as a few players mentioned in this video were consultants on it. Uh, and even a few made cameos, Leon Lee and Brad Leslie. So with that out of the way, uh, like, comment, subscribe. I've been Gaijin Baseball. Thank you for watching.